everyone, and welcome to A Mighty Blaze Celebrity Conversations. I'm your host, Jane Roper, and I'm so happy to see everyone here today. Uh, we have two fantastic authors uh, who will be in conversation today. Really thrilled to meet them both. Um, having a great chat back in the green room, the virtual green room. Um, we have <laughs> joining us here from Kenosha, Wisconsin, we have Larry Watson, uh, and we also have Roxana Robinson with us today. So I will do a couple of brief intros of these two, and then I'm going to turn it back over to them and they will take it away and chat. And if you have questions as you're watching, if you're watching us live, feel free to throw them in the chat box. And um, if we have a chance, we will uh, present them to the authors. Uh, in the meantime, just sit back, relax and enjoy. Um, Larry, first of all, welcome Larry. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, Larry is the author of 11 novels, including The Lives of Edie Pritchard, As Good as Gone, and Let Him Go, which was recently made into a film starring Diane Lane and Kevin Costner. That's very cool. When's that coming out? That will, uh, that will be released November 6th. Very exciting. Very exciting. So they managed to get a film before the world collapsed. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, Larry Watson is also the author of the fiction collection Justice, the poetry collection Late Assignments, and the chapbook of poetry Leaving Dakota. His fiction has been published in 10 foreign editions. He has received prizes and awards from Milkweed Press, the New York Library, the High Plains Book Award, and many others. He has published short stories and poems in Gettysburg Review, New England Review, North American Review, and others. And his essays and book reviews have appeared in the LA Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Sun-Times and elsewhere. Larry's newest book published in July is The Lives of Edie Pritchard. Publisher Weekly, Publishers Weekly praises it saying, set mostly in Eastern Montana, Watson's vibrant character study reads like a trio of scintillating novellas, each set 20 years apart. Like in the best works of Richard Ford and Elizabeth Strout, Watson shows off a keen eye for regional details, a pitch perfect ear for dialogue and an affinity for sharp characterization. This triptych is rich, richly rewarding. I love the word triptych and I'm so glad they used it. <laughs> the Minneapolis Star Tribune says, Larry Watson is a richly, oh, uh, blah, blah, sorry. Larry Watson is a riveting storyteller. This is a fast and compelling read, sparse and dusty as the ocean plain, the open plain, not the ocean plain. That would be strange. As the open plain. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, Larry. Thank you. And Roxana Robinson is the author of six novels, including Sparta, which is the winner of the Main Fiction Award, uh, Cost, winner of Main Writers and Publishing Alliance Fiction Award, and her most recent, Dawson's Fall. She is also the author of three collections of short stories and the biography, Georgia O'Keeffe, A Life. Four of her books were chosen as New York Times Notable Books, two as New York Times Editor's Choice Choices. Uh, Roxana's fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Harper's, Best American Short Stories, Tin House, and elsewhere. Her work has been widely anthologized and broadcast on NPR. Her books have been published in England, France, German, Holland, and Spain. Germany, Holland, and Spain. My reading comprehension today is, is suffering. I don't know what's happening. Roxana has received fellowships from the NEA. Uh, the McDowell Colony and the Guggenheim Foundation. She was named a literary lion by the New York Public Library and she was the winner of the 2019 Barnes and Noble Writers for Writers Award from Poets and Writers. Um, of Roxana's new novel, Dawson's Fall, which is sitting there behind her it, uh, on the shelf, you can see it back there. Uh, Booklist says this documentary novel proves unyielding and compelling in its timely themes with many depictions of how white men's seething resentment erupts into racist violence and how Southern codes of honor and toxic values, particularly slavery, corroded individual lives and the national character. Author Amy Bloom calls Roxana a great American storyteller and never better than when she braids history and fiction, pulling truth out of mere facts. Welcome Roxana, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. All right. Well, uh, I look forward to hearing you two chat. Larry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Uh, and thanks again to Almighty Blaze for uh, setting this up. It's just a, a, a wonderful series of events. Uh, I'm really honored to be talking to the inestimable Roxana Robinson today. I'm a big fan of her writing. 
uh, both fiction and nonfiction. I just loved your uh, Georgia O'Keeffe biography. And I also admire the work that you've done on behalf of writers through the Authors Guild. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on Dawson's Fall today, which has been widely praised. You stole a couple of my <laughs> blurbs, Jane. Oh, sorry. Uh, Could say right. him again. Quite, quite <laughs> all right. Uh, Publishers Weekly, Robinson's Descriptive and Imaginative Prose Sings. Um, in a starred review, Kirka said, Robinson uses lynchings, duels, and sexual assaults to shed light on populism and toxic masculinity. And uh, once again, this from Booklist, Robinson's documentary novel proves unyielding and compelling in its timely themes. Uh, but apart from my admiration for her writing, I was especially interested in talking to her about Dawson's Fall because she and I share something that I have to believe is not especially common in the 21st century. And that is that both of us had great grandfathers who fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Um, William Faulkner's great grandfather fought for the Confederacy and Faulkner died in 1862. Um, but while this, in, in 1962, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but in our family, this fact wasn't much more than a kind of genealogical oddity. Um, you managed to turn this part of your heritage into a work of art. Um, do you want to get us started by talking a little bit about that family connection? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I think that uh, when you start out writing, you write to free yourself from your family, you write um, to break loose from whatever you grew up encased by. Um, and then you write about the world. And then as you get older, not that I'm getting older, or Larry's getting older, but if we were, um, then you start looking back and you start looking at your family to find out what you did come from and looking for some kind of understanding about who you are in in connect, in relation to your family. So um, in my family, it, it's, it's odd because I grew up um, sort of feeling that I was part of my mother's family, which is very much a New England family. And on my mother's side, there's Harry, uh, Harry Beecher Stowe and Henry Ward Beecher, who is my great, great grandfather. And I grew up um, being in New England uh, a lot of the time. So feeling that I was very much a Northerner and that um, our family had really taken a position on slavery and abolition and that I never had to write a word about that because um, anything I said would not be could not be measured against um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is one of the most influential books ever written about slavery. So what would I have to say that, that hadn't already been said by someone in my family? So I never thought of writing about that. And then um, when my parents moved out of their house, which was probably 10 years ago, um, everybody was going through it and finding things in the attic. And uh, both my mother and my father inherited lots and lots of family stuff. And we came across a small piece of mahogany, worked mahogany, with a note on it in my grandmother's writing saying, this is a part of the pew at St. Michael's before the renovation. And I knew it was where my grandparents had been married in Charleston, South Carolina. And I knew that because Dawson was, was well known in South Carolina and because Charleston is the city it is. I knew somebody there would want this piece of mahogany, this piece of the pew of St. Michael's. And I had a friend in Charleston and I emailed her and I said, who, who would like this? Who's the head of the historical society? And um, so she sent it out this message and we got but apparently three different organizations wanted this piece of mahogany, this little thing. So, and then to, I got an email from two scholars who were writing a book about Dawson. And I sent off the piece of wood and then I started communicating with the scholars and they asked if I would come down to Charleston and appear with them um, in connection to their book. And so I did and went down and sort of fell under the spell of Charleston and because it is so beautiful and so beautifully preserved, everything in Dawson's life is still there. His house is still there. The house around the corner is still there. The streets where he walked are the same. 
And I became, began feeling more and more interested by his story, which is very dramatic and really knitted into the history of this country. And he was a particularly interesting lens through which to look at all this because he came from England and because he was opposed to many of the things that we think of as being part of the Confederacy. So, and also in our family, he'd been sort of considered a hero because he was a progressive um, in a place where there were few progressive voices. And then the more I did research, the more I realized that it was much more complicated than him simply being a wonderful, heartwarming progressive, that there were sides to him that I did not approve of. Um, and then the more I learned about the period, the more fascinated I became. And as Larry knows, once you that something gets into your head, there's no way around it but to write through it. So that's what I, that's what I did. That's fascinating. Would, would you say that, that that being in the place was the sort of the point of entry for you for uh, the actual, for the novel itself? I mean, I, I, I sometimes think that there's, sometimes we need just a, a tiny thing to move into the fiction. Maybe it's, I've got a scar on my knee. Oh, my main character is going to have a scar on his knee. Um, sure. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and as you as you know, it can be something very tiny and and simple, um, and it may have no bearing on what the final book is is about. But I think it was the sense of place and and um, being involved in this event. Um, <clears throat> They, my great grandmother was famous for having very long hair. And oddly enough, in my family, some of that hair was passed down. I'm sorry to say, it sounds kind of grisly and horrible, but she was very proud of it. And so I still have it. I have this length of hair. And I remember my father, there was, the piece I have is only about this long, but there is a piece, there was a piece somewhere that I remember my father holding it up to his head and it came down to his ankles. Um, and so this was part of the family drama and glamour, this, this incredibly long hair. And so this, these scholars invited me down and they said, would you be part of this event, which is about Dawson? And I'm a terrible ham. So I, of course I said, yes. And I said, do you want me to bring the hair? And <laughs> so I brought the hair. And in fact, I washed, I shampooed the hair and conditioned it, and it, which of course hadn't been shampooed since she died in 1904, um, which was really strange. It's a very strange idea to handle part of the dead body of someone in your family, but, um, but it was also beautiful. So anyway, all these sort of mysterious um, elements came together and, and I, um, so, well, I, I don't want to do a spoiler, but there's a part in the book in which my great grandmother did something very dramatic, and so I stood on stage and I and I had I stood up in the beginning, I guess, and then while they were talking, I I clipped this sw switch back onto the back of my hair, <laughs> and then I stood up and I walked across the stage and I did this thing that my great grandmother had done, and then I swished the hair in front of me and I said, "And this is her hair." <laughs> So it was, <laughs> it just sort of brought me into the whole story in an incredibly visceral way. And once I had engaged at that level, I was kind of done for. I, I couldn't go back. Uh, that's wonderful. I, you know, there are just so many terrific scenes in the novel. <laughs> and I was going to mention two, and they, they, they couldn't be more different. Uh, one would be that, that horrific Hamburg massacre. But the other was the letting down the, the hair. That's just such a great scene. And, and especially because it does something to uh, Frank Dawson. Yeah. Well, that came from, I mean, everything in the book comes from somewhere in the archives. It's, and, it, and my, the letters were preserved. So we have lots of letters and, and diaries. And, and she writes about that, um, and is, is sort of laughingly complaining. It was her brother who made her do it. And so, mm -hmm. but it's such an incredibly powerful erotic mm -hmm. moment. And, it, and also to do it in the bosom of the family. So her mother and her brother are there when, when this happens. Mm -hmm. um, and and she, it was something she was very proud of. So I knew that was part of the scene. So it was, it was really fun to write that scene. Mm -hmm. And Hamburg, um, I, 
I came across, I mean, the way I approached the book, which is the way I've approached all the topics that I've written about heroin addiction, um, the war in Iraq, and now re uh, redemption in the South, there are topics that are so large and there is so much written about them that I knew that I couldn't approach them the way a scholar would, which is by reading what everybody else has written, because it would, you know, it would take 20 years. It would take my, take my whole life to become a Civil War scholar. So instead, um, with as with Sparta, I decided not to read anything that historians or or political writers had written about the Middle East. I would only read um, first person narratives by people who had been there, because I wanted to write about that. Not larger um, political story. So with this, the Civil War, um, and thereafter, I only read first-person narratives. And uh, so that's how I came across Dawson, who was very much a voice um, of the story of Hamburg. And I, the more I delved into it, the more rich and horrifying it became. And it also allowed me, when I first gave, when this book first came out, um, I gave a reading at the Center for Fiction in New York and somebody raised his hand and said, how can you tell a story about slavery only using white voices? And I said, I didn't, I didn't, that there are black voices in this. And, and the great boon of um, this particular incident is that there was a congressional investigation done of it. And the congressional um, uh, committee came down to South Carolina and interviewed the people who had survived. So I had their voices written down word for word. So I wasn't counting on white people remembering or pretending to write in somebody else's dialect. I could have word for word the, the account of the people who were there. Yeah. So it was, it was incredibly fortunate for me to be able to create this scene um, from all sides. Yeah, yeah. and, and those, those reports um, are, are just so poignant um, uh, and, and so matter of fact. So matter of fact, it's just, uh, they're heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. It, heartbreaking and electrifying. I mean, you sort yeah. of think, God, this really is the, the exchange that would take place. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, not long ago, I read uh, Daniel Mendelssohn's Lost, uh, The Lost. And um, that scene from the, uh, in the Hamburg Massacre <laughs> reminded me of something in, in uh, The Lost when the German soldiers are taking Jews away from the village one at a time, and um, they know they're walking to their to their deaths. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, a wonderful book. Uh, there are a lot of different styles in this book. Um, um, so of course you have something from uh, your great grandmother's diaries, um, which which really read. Well, I mean, uh, they they uh, they don't seem contemporary, but they don't seem antique either. Um, and uh, you have newspaper articles, and so um, tell me a little bit about that decision to use those those documents and to bring in those different voices, and then knowing that you had to accommodate your narrative style in such a way that, that, that they could all fit together? Uh, it's a great question. And I, I know you're a writer because you're asking it. But um, so when I read these th this material, particularly my grandmother's, my great grandmother's diaries, she was actually a very good writer. And so, you know, in the beginning, I was thinking this is going to be a novel, it's all going to be in my voice. And that's, that's the rule, that's what you have to do, right? You have to have the same voice or you, it's even if you choose different voices, it's still you, the writers. And so I started off by, par by rewriting her entries, but she was such a good writer and the writing was, was just fine. It was perfect the way it was. And she had, especially this, the story of her father's death is so moving and so beautifully presented, I felt embarrassed and kind of um, criminal by seizing her ideas and then putting them into my words, which I didn't feel were particularly better than hers. So I made the decision to to use their words and, and his, all the editorials are his, his words and the letters are his. So 
they were both um, they were both good writers. So I, I felt that I couldn't, in in good conscience, um, give up their their words. So that meant me, then that I had to ask the question: Is this a novel or is mm -hmm. it somebody else? It, what am I doing? I couldn't decide, and I and I kept changing the book back and forth. It was going to be a novel. No, it was going to be a biography. No, it was going to be a novel. Um, and I ended up by being unable to give up either part of it. I mean, since I had written a biography, I was very comfortable with that form, and I love that form, and I love the feeling that the facts are your um, absolute guidelines. You cannot ever yield on a fact or um, write something that isn't factually true. So. I had that as my, my motto um, in this book, and, and I, because I'm a biographer, I don't I don't agree with the idea that you can you're, if you're writing a novel you can change about a famous person you can change the facts. I don't think you should. If you if you're going to change the facts, then don't use the name, the real name. Yep. You should either do one or the other. So um, I felt a real obligation to tell the truth, um, but I also couldn't give up the interior voice that the novelist is allowed to use. And I couldn't give up di dialogue, which is so powerful and such a useful tool. Yeah. So I ended up um, calling it a biographical novel. And I was sort of thinking, well, I'm creating something new. And then, of course, I realized that Hilary Mantel had actually gotten there before me um, and done something very brilliant and with perfect with, with this same notion. Um, but it is based on that, that you can, you can make a story. Uh, it turns out that she, I thought everything she did, she wrote was factually supported, but it turns out that she said that wasn't exactly true. But anyway, mine is, I, I haven't said anything in this book that I don't believe is true. And, and even the dialogue usually comes from something that I read in a diary or a journal or a letter. Um, so it's all based on what I know of these, of these characters. But, um, don't you think too, though, that there is something apart from the facts of the material that that you operate differently if you, uh, by obeying a kind of novelist's instinct or intuition or impulse or something like that? So you might make decisions about structure or scene or something like that that uh, uh, might belong to the fiction writer's toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. It's not um, the way the scenes are constructed has, you're right, they have nothing to do with a biographer. They're, they're a novelist's view of the way a scene should end. Yeah. The, uh, uh, some of the scenes toward, toward the end of the novel, uh, th those could be a, those could be a screenwriter's <laughs> um, work. I mean, uh, it, it just played cinematically, and and even the way you you would cut from scene to scene, and you could see these two adversaries coming closer and closer together. I don't want to do any uh, plot spoilers here, but uh, something very dramatic happens, and we see that it's going to happen, and it's inevitable, but it's still just full of of suspense. I thought that was so well, so well done, and it was interesting too. I thought because here's a, a novel that's just been swirling with, with these great large themes having to do with our country's social structure, political structure, and then towards the end it comes down to something very, it's within the, the very household, the Dawson household. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's so remarkable. Intimate, it's so intimate, yeah. I know, and, and um, you know, because it's my family, and it's a, because it's a story that I've heard since I was a child, you keep trying to re rerun the tape and make it come out differently. And um, but as with any tragic event, it, it, the seeds are within the character, so that it, it it couldn't have come out differently because mm -hmm. of who those two men were. I um, well, since you mentioned that, I was going to ask about if there were parts of this that were especially difficult to write, and now I'm not talking necessarily about getting historical details right, but emotionally difficult because these are people that you sort of brought back to life and, um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's funny. I mean, so one of the things, 
One of the things that I learned about writing the O'Keefe book was that um, I was asked to write her book, that book after she died. And so of course I couldn't interview her. Not that it would have been easy to interview Georgia O'Keeffe. It would have been terrifying and it probably would have stopped the whole project. She was so daunting, but, but I couldn't interview her. Um, and so in one sense, that was, that was a disappointment as a biographer, but I talked, of course, to many members of her family and I learned, I realized at some point that talking to the family members um, it is a, is a, delivers a kind of cultural research information that you couldn't get in any other way. And so that as I was talking to her nieces and nephews and her grand nieces and nephews, I was, I was learning to understand, I was getting a, a sense of the O'Keefe family culture. And it dawned on me, I realized um, that I not only didn't have to interview these people, but I myself was a product of this family culture. So that there were things that were intuitive that I didn't have to find out about. Um, that I understood because I was I was the product of this way this kind of thinking, and uh, at one point um, my grandmother Ethel, or somebody maybe her brother, uh, wrote in as a part of a memoir saying that Dawson had come home, he'd go to a musical event, an, an opera or a concert, and he'd come home, um, and and sit down at the piano and he would play by ear a song, it's a musical thing that he had just heard that he'd never heard before. And how Sarah loved listening to that. And it gave me chills because that's what my father did. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Yeah. He would come oh. and sit down and play. He had a yeah. So um, I, it, I thought, okay, I, there's, uh, it's perfectly legitimate for me to write this story because I'm part of it in, yeah. in, a, in a strange way. So, um, and there was there were there were mysteries, but they were um, one of them was why did the, this couple separate for two years, and why did Sarah move to live in Europe? Um, and I I just it was well known, but I, I couldn't figure out why they had done it. Uh, it's in other by it's in other books about them that she was gone for two years with the children. And I thought, is there, you know, did she have a lover in Europe or did he have a lover? Is there something that is there some horrible family secret that I'm gonna have to put down that I don't want to know about? Um, and but the letter seemed very loving and tender, and he went to visit her many times. And finally I figured it out by putting pieces together, which was that. Uh, Sarah came from an um, affluent family in Baton Rouge and in the Deep South, many affluent families lived far apart from any town or place where there was a school. And so the, the people taught their own children at home. Uh, they either hired tutors or they had other family members, but people, kids learned it at home. Dawson, by contrast, was Catholic and English, and he had gone away to boarding school quite young. He'd gone to a very rigorous boarding school where that was Catholic, and he'd been brought up. Um, so when he graduated from school, he spoke Latin, Greek, and fluent French, and he had been uh, raised as a Catholic. So what he wanted was to send his kids to a Catholic school where they would speak French. And in America, in the South Carolina, there just weren't any options for that. So this was the compromise. She said, uh, and she said, well, I'm not sending them to Europe on their own. They're not going to boarding school in Europe. So the compromise was they went to school in Europe and she went to. So I could write about their marriage as being happy. And this was, they both thought that education was the central um, intention. So that made the whole thing, that made sense of the whole thing. Yeah, uh, they, were, they were such a, a sophisticated, worldly, pair of uh, family. And, and so I thought too that it made a certain kind of sense. Um, I mean, I know that Europe was, was difficult, travel back and forth was difficult, and yet Europe was, was very much a part of their lives to be European or, or, or continental or something like that, um, speaking French at home, for example. and. Um, it, it was interesting. One of my students um, who, when we read Madame Bovary, one of my students gave a presentation about medicine in 19th century France. And um, this was very interesting to me. She said that, that Paris was really the center 
of scientific of medical study in the 1850s and 60s. And that's where Sarah's brother went to study medicine. And because um, Louisiana had been a French colony, French was widely spoken still in the 1850s and 60s. So their family all spoke French. And so it made sense for her brother Henry to go to, to Paris, which is something I hadn't realized that that was where many American students went. So it was certainly a part of her family culture to speak French and the idea of going to France, although she never had been herself until that trip. And of course, um, for Dawson, who'd grown up in England, it was, and he'd taken the Grand Tour. Yeah. Um, that was a very, so I think that was one of the things that he did for the Charleston News and Courier. He was very cosmopolitan and he put into that newspaper news of po the politics in Europe and the arrival of the European Opera Company. And he just made that part of the cultural conversation in South Carolina. He brought in all of Europe in a way that um, was very dashing kind of. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been talking so much about, about um, research and historical fact and historical details that are a part of the novel, uh, but there is so much in the novel that seems that it could only have come from, from, from lived experience. I mean, it's one thing to talk, to go into an old home and see how it was furnished or something like that, but um, you do things like talking about how, how the cobblestones look wet after a rain. You talk about how the snow melts on a, on, on a horse's back. Um, it's just full of those details that are so convincing and so immediate and, and vivid. I'm tempted to ask you how you do it, but um, you know, I, there's that old story, W.C. Fields was once asked how he juggled and then for three years he couldn't juggle after that. So, uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the, um, as you know, the, um, well, so, who was it? Somebody said, uh, there is no such thing, no writer makes up physical details. They all come from some kind of lived experience. And, and one, of the, one of my entry points into this landscape, this period, was through animals and the natural world. Um, so all the horses and the dogs and the birds and the plants um, were things that were very, those are ac my access points. Um, and one of the other things, the feelings of intimacy and familiarity I had was that Sarah was a gardener and um, loved gardening and, and so, was, so was Dawson and, and I'm a gardener. So in her diaries, she's writing about plants and, and how he loved roses. Um, so those things made the whole thing very easy for me to enter into it because, they, because they're, it's my family. So I know how they felt about things, yeah. Um, I, I was also interested in your decision not to tell the story strictly chronologically. So we meet uh, Dawson and then we move into his past. And I, and I thought it worked really well because it, it is exactly the way it often happens when we meet people. We meet them, we get to know them, and then the longer we know them, the more we know about their lives and their their past. That's really interesting. Um, so I agonized over that and um, changed it back and forth many times. And there are things on Amazon that say, don't read this book, it's so boring in the beginning. Um, and uh, and or one you know one review says it's a slog in the beginning, but but it's worth it <laughs> by the end. But I, as a biographer, I couldn't I couldn't give up the stories of Sarah and Frank as as young people. Um, Frank's character is revealed so vividly, and um, the story of his family I thought was so interesting and and so formative. I mean, it gives you such a, you know, we need to know about Emma Bovary going to the convent school. That's really important as part of that book. And for me, it was really important to know that Frank Dawson came from a family in which his father was not always um, successful and he was not the supporter of the family and that Frank felt that that was his role. And so that explains what he did when he came to this country. He really took on the burden of, of everything and he welcomed that. And I felt that you you needed to know that, and then you needed to know Sarah's background that she had undergone something. And, and again, for a northerner, from someone from New England, 
um, the realization, the, the reliving for me of what it was like to be um, bombarded in your own house, to be in, in a town that, where people are shooting cannonballs at you, um, gave me a very different sense of the South and, and the Civil War, so a very new sense of sympathy. Um, so I, I just felt it was necessary. I couldn't just jump in in 1886 and say, okay, Frank and Sarah Dawson are uh, happily married and living in Charleston, South Carolina, without telling you how they got there and not, without giving you a sense of the texture of their characters and what they had um, struggled to get through to reach this, this um, what was for a while a plateau of happiness and success. So I'm glad, thank you for your kind words. I'm glad you, you thought it was useful. It just seemed necessary to me, although that's not the most dramatic part. The most dramatic part comes in the second half. Yeah, um, and, and uh, also once we know that some of the, their background, it also um, adds an emotional complication to their relationship in a good way, in a believable and convincing way. And I think we realize then that like a lot of good relationships, they have worked at it and there are certain things that they have had to um, overcome, accommodate, you know. Yeah, I mean, they, there are certainly arguments, although that was one thing I didn't have access to because Dawson writes his own memoir, which is called um, Reminiscences of a Confederate Soldier, which is well-written, thoughtful, not very long, it's quite interesting. Um, and then Sarah writes her diaries and journals and she writes after the, this, this book happens, she writes an account of it. Um, but then, and then later both her children write extensively about what it was like growing up with their parents. But by then it's all sort of hagiography. They, nobody had a, a, an unkind word to say about anybody. So I wasn't getting the friction that I wanted. So I had to imagine that, but I, that was one thing I, I couldn't get to because there was a layer of just sort of worshipful reminiscence that I, that I couldn't get past. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe you could say a few words about uh, uh, McDowell and, and Helene. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> It's wonderful and awful to watch, to see them together. Um, so she's this uh, remarkable <coughs> figure who was also part of our fam <coughs> family story. And I remember my father telling me a story about her. So he'd gotten it from his mother. So it's, you know, it's three degrees of separation. He told this story with terrible feeling of anxiety and that's what his mother must have felt when Sarah turns on against Ellen. Um, so it was very vivid, it was very visceral to me listening to my father with this anxiety in his voice and saying that she has, she said, get out and, and what it felt like for my father because he'd heard his mother say that. So I started off feeling sympathetic towards Ellen, but um, the more I read uh, from the newspaper, I'm not going to say why she was in the newspaper, but um, the more <laughs> she became an ambiguous character and there was so much um, that was documented about her that I, I came to feel that I did understand her, that she was, you know, she was a young woman. She wasn't, she wasn't vicious, she wasn't malevolent, but she was, she was not very deep. She was quite superficial and she just was um, ready to have fun without regard for anybody else. And so she just got into an unthinkable situation. It, it, so I ended up not, I started off by thinking that she was an innocent and she was treated very badly towards the end of the book um, by the people who were in authority. Yeah. So that was kind of a shockingly um, striking example of, you know, the patriarchy at work. Yeah. But it still didn't mean that she was innocent because she um, wasn't quite. You know, I, once again, I don't, I, I, I don't want to give away 
something toward the ending of this book, but there is a tragic incident um, uh, that's, that's uh, very difficult to read about. But even worse is that there is an injustice following that that makes it even harder to, to take. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, it was really something. There's a question for you not to answer. <laughs> so. Well, that's certainly part of the family story too. I mean, that's why this it's, story yeah. was, was told. Yeah. Um, with this echoing that uh, shock um, that would go down in in any family, um, that would be something that was that we couldn't. You can't resolve. You can't. You can never make it better. You can never make it come out right. So it's a story that gets told over and over in every generation. Mm -hmm. uh, Rexina, we were we were talking a little bit uh, before uh, before we came on about how uh, you know many of the the themes that you were writing about in the you know the the reconstruction era post-civil war um sort of are having these echoes now with what we're seeing in the news and what's been happening over the past few months so i i was really curious to understand uh from your point of view did the research you did on this book um I don't know, change the way you perceived what's been happening over the past few months or or vice versa? Does, you know, in, in watching the sort of racial reckoning that's been happening and, and some of the ramping up of uh, violence that's been happening um, from, you know, has that changed your view of, of your book? Um, yeah, both things are true. I mean, the book change, writing the book changed my understanding of this country mm -hmm. and watching what's happened since it came out has, has sort of, illuminated um, what I, the, the research that I did, the knowledge that I acquired. Um, somebody asked me to write an essay recently called, uh, on the militarization of the police, which was um, a great topic to sort of delve into. Be, um, it, and it drew on research that I had done for Sparta on what it's like to be trained as a, as a to kill people. But also it drew very strongly on, on Dawson's fall because I now understand things I hadn't understood before about why we carry guns and the tradition of carrying guns in this country is a straight is directly related to slavery yep. and that's when white men started carrying guns with the claim that they they needed to to protect their property which meant runaway <laughs> slaves um, and it it car you know they use this this false argument that the second amendment was to allow civilians to carry guns when it really meant that that this country should have its own militia, which meant the the army. It didn't mean people um, carrying guns in their glove compartment. So, but um, you know, we have created this situation in which I think it's something like forty percent of all the guns in the world are owned by civilians in America, mm -hmm. and so uh, there's a reason that we have policemen, police people who shoot people when they shouldn't because they go out, unlike any other developed country, they go out into the civilian landscape knowing that they may be shot at any moment. And that's not true in England or Germany or France. So we've created this, this trigger happy or hair trigger set of circumstances that um, is based on racism. And, you know, I think we're helpless. So we can't seem to pass any gun control legislation which would calm things down right. but we have a we have a gun happy um population uh, who use guns based on on an inhumane institution based on the presence of that and we're just living out this nightmare of violence in uh, yeah i mean there are so many things that 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 draw the line from then to now i mean i I mentioned Faulkner earlier, and I, I thought over and over again about his his uh, remark: that "The past is never dead; it's not even past." Um, and um, and in this novel, you come to understand that that violence, lynching, of course, they are expressions of of brutality and savagery, but they are also tactics, strategies for controlling others and, and for asserting a certain kind of, I think, uh, political will in many cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the things that struck me when I was doing this research was 
Um, the fact that, so we're in the 19th century, we're 1875, say, and nobody moves around. Um, most people don't take even the railroad. So th the way people get from one place to another is by walking or by horse, by carriage. So, so if you, after emancipation, the people who were part of a plantation still live within 20 feet of each other. So for the whites, it was inconceivable, it was absolutely unacceptable to be in the presence of people whom they thought they owned, whom they now don't. And that's what drove this cruelty, this sense of rage and resentment, that they now had to pay wages to the same people they never had to before. And this visceral sense of resentment was was part of this. And they, the real when I realized that the, what happened in Hamburg was what happened all across the South. So here's this the town of Hamburg, which Hamburg, which is all black, and it's right at the uh, at the edge of Edgefield, which is all white. And there, everyone in Edgefield is resentful of everyone in Hamburg, and they live right next to each other, and they ride through each other's towns. And every time they see each other, they are resentful. The whites mostly. Yeah. So um, I realized it's in a way that I had never thought about before, this sense of continuing rage that would be um, the legacy of, of those years. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's an observation in the novel that, that uh, made me gasp, but of course, uh, just a moment's thought about it makes you realize it's truth. Uh, and that was something uh, uh, about the cotton industry. And what was essential for the cotton industry to uh, turn a profit? Yeah, free labor. Yeah. So, um, and, and cotton, you know, was, was the engine that really made America a player on the world stage economically. We had cheap cotton and we took over the market from India, which had had the had controlled the market before, but we had free labor. So we could produce it cheaper than anyone else in the world. And so we, you know, cotton became this gigantic economic machine. And that's what, so people in the North depended on that as well as people in the South who were, who were personally part of it. So it became a national engine that, that was, um, you know, the whole country. So her, when Harry Beecher Stowe took on that institution, she was flying in the face of many, many different parts of our culture, politics and the economy um, across the country and the, the culture, this belief that this was, this was ordained by God, it was all right, that Jesus had condoned it, condoned it and the whole economy depended on it. Yeah. So it was, it was this monolith. Sure. And, and how could free labor be controlled? Only through violence. Right. Yeah. All right. I hate to leave things on, on that cheery note. Um, <laughs> so I, I will I'll add a cheerier note and, and say, uh, first of all, thank you so much to you both. This is fascinating. Um, I, it's just been really, really interesting hearing more about your book, Roxanne, and your, and your research and, and listening to, to uh, chat. And I want to encourage our uh, viewers, anyone who's watching, um, please, uh, please pick up uh, the books of both of these authors. Um, you can get, uh, I believe, signed copies, right, of Dawson's Fall at, um, at um, House of Books in Kent, Connecticut. Um, and I assume you can order online. From them uh, as yeah. well as if you uh, can can stop by um, and then for uh, Larry's books uh, for the lives of Edie Pritchard and others um, head to or head online to Boswell books in Milwaukee um, that's his his independent bookstore of course um, and if you want you can also find those books on uh, bookshop.org um, and the mighty blaze store there so thank you both so much for being here really appreciate it Thank you, Jane. And thank you, Larry. Those are wonderful questions. That was a really rich and wonderful conversation. Thank you. Oh, uh, you're, you're welcome, both of you. Thank you. It was just uh, such a pleasure to be part of this. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.